I want to uh, thank Patrick Lundy and the Ministers of Music and the Duke Ellington School of the Arts Concert Choir. Yes. Yes, wonderful performances. Um, I'm Aslahan Bulut, and I have the privilege of uh, serving as the Law Librarian of Congress. It's my honor to welcome you to a celebration of the investiture of Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson. The Library of Congress and the US Supreme Court have enjoyed a long history of successful collaborations, and we are very pleased to host this event to celebrate this historic occasion. Before we begin, uh, I would like to mention that the library is recording this special event. I would ask that you please turn off your cell phones and refrain from any personal video recording or photography. At this time, I would like to welcome the Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, and Harvard Radcliffe Institute Dean Tomiko Brown Nagin to the stage. Dean Brown Nagin is the author of Civil Rights Queen, uh, Constance Baker Mutley and the Struggle for Equality, a biography about the pathbreaking civil rights attorney, federal judge, and politician Constance Baker Mutley. True librarian, I have the book. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, and thank all of you for being here. This is truly a wonderful occasion, and I'm so glad that all of you are with us. So we thought, what better way to add to the celebration than to talk about the history, but also, to, you told me, Dean, that there's no better person when you think about the history to celebrate than the person that you wrote about. I would say that is exactly right. Uh, there could be no Katanji Brown Jackson without Constance Baker Motley. The fates of the two are linked. Justice Jackson, uh, and I'm so happy to be a part of this historic day, is heir to the legacy of Constance Baker Motley. Uh, and so it is appropriate to uh, join the two this afternoon as we celebrate Justice Jackson's investiture. I uh, began my work about Constance Baker Motley uh, because as I was writing a prior book, I came to the conclusion that she was truly one of the most remarkable figures of the 20th century, one of the greats. And that was because I concluded of her contributions in three different aspects of public life. First, as a civil rights lawyer working under the tutelage of Thurgood Marshall. Then as an elected official in the state of New York and the city of New York. And finally, as the first black woman ever to serve as a federal judge. She was appointed by President Johnson in 1966 to what is called the Mother Court, mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. District Court in Manhattan, uh, the trial court that was established and called the Mother Court uh, because it was organized even before the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and this is a person whom Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who of course is another incredible pathbreaker, called her human rights hero. Justice Ginsburg said that Motley had taught her generation of lawyers how to use the courts and the law for social change. Motley was, during her lifetime, frequently uh, compared to Thurgood Marshall. And saying that they were uh, equally great in terms of their lawyering skill. And Marshall himself once observed that uh, Motley just came into the Inkman offices, walked in and took over, uh, he said, because of the remaining contributions. And so this is a person who deserves to be recognized, to be celebrated, uh, and I, I think that she hasn't uh, gotten her due. Um, uh, because she's been overshadowed by Marshall, 
uh, by uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who was her client. And of course, I think we can do, we can celebrate all of these people uh, because they all are, are great Americans who did so much to ensure that we all can be together here today with, regardless of race. And in doing some research, <laughs> I noted that she was really the, the lead on several civil rights cases, even one for admitting someone to library science <laughs> at the right. University of Alabama. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Arthurine Luthi. So what, when you think about her legacy and what she was leading on in civil rights, what, do you, what would you say sure. were the cases that she really? Right, well lead? first uh, I would turn to Brown versus Board of Education. Motley wrote the original complaint in that case and also worked on the briefs uh, in a case that is, uh, by consensus, one of the great constitutional law cases of the 20th century. Uh, and then after the court decided Brown, she went across the South litigating cases that implemented that decision in uh, cities like Little Rock, New Orleans, Atlanta. Uh, beyond that, she uh, argued uh, Katzenbach versus McClung, which was the case in which the U.S. Supreme Court sustained the public accommodations title of the Civil Rights Act. It was deeply controversial. Uh, her first Supreme Court oral argument was Hamilton versus Alabama, uh, a case in which she successfully argued that criminal defendants in capital cases are entitled to counsel during arraignment. And I will say, Carla, she argued 10 uh, cases in the US Supreme Court, winning nine of them. And then later, the justices reversed themselves in the one case that she had lost. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and so she has just an excellent record. And uh, so as you hear so much about uh, Thurgood Marshall's imposing presence at, at arguing. What about her presence mm. uh, and what when she was arguing? Because still, it's a woman. Absolutely. She is the first black woman known to have argued at the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, she, was, she was stellar. She was amazing. She knew her stuff backwards and forwards. In fact, one of the things that I point out in the book is that although when she went down south and litigated uh, cases. She was subjected to uh, dignitary harms. There were opposing counsel who wouldn't shake her hand, judges who would turn their backs on her. She always understood how great she was as a lawyer and was particularly happy that she could call her cases off by heart while the other attorneys were stumbling trying to figure out uh, what, what principle to argue. Uh, so just a, a terrific uh, lawyer, very reserved, graceful, very calm, very hard to throw her off her game. Oh, <laughs> it makes you want to just be there <laughs> and see it. Now she did, and then she spent, what, over f three or four decades as a federal district mm -hmm. judge, and she presided over cases, and one that really caught my eye on whether a female reporter could interview baseball players in the locker room, mm. because that's where you get the scoop <laughs> after the game. So what happened with that one? Well, you know, it, it's perhaps hard to imagine today, but this was one of her most controversial cases. Uh, it was Lucky versus Kuhn, and a constitutional case where this female reporter sued because she wasn't allowed into the locker room. And as you say, this was the context in which the baseball players would relax. And so it's where all of the journalists wanted to be. And there was a ban on female reporters. Um, Motley drew the case. Uh, and I have to tell you, she knew nothing about baseball. <laughs> just nothing <laughs> about baseball, didn't care very much about sports, but she did understand the principle that was at issue. Uh, and although the New York Yankees and Major League Baseball argued that uh, privacy was the, a, a rationale, legitimate rationale for keeping um, Ms. Lucky, Lucky out, she said, well, let them wear towels. 
Um, the, the female journalist can be in the locker room and the men can clothe themselves and she can have her constitutional rights. And it was just a terrific um, uh, decision by Motley. And there are a few others I, I, can, I can talk about if you'd like. What were the cases then that she really felt were going to probably be named as part of her legacy? Were there certain cases that she felt strong? Sure. Well, it, it, one cannot talk about the legacy of Judge Motley on the bench without talking about Blank versus Sullivan and Cromwell. This was a case brought by um, female law school graduates who were not being hired by um, Sullivan and Cromwell, which is one of the premier um, law firms. And uh, Motley drew the case. The law firm was not happy uh, because she was this famous civil rights lawyer. And a, an attorney for the firm actually wrote her a letter and then filed a motion for recusal. He said to her that because she was a woman and a black woman and had been a civil rights attorney that she could not be fair to the firm. Uh, he said it. He, he wrote it down. In, in print. <laughs> he did. He did. That might not have been so and, smart. And she rejected that argument and wrote this really clever opinion in which she turned the lawyer's argument on its head, saying that, that if sex or race or background were a reason by themselves to disqualify a judge from hearing a case, then no judge on the court could hear the case, right? because uh, white men have a race and a gender and a practice background, and, and it's just a terrific case that has continuing relevance because, unfortunately, uh, one finds that uh, often um, judges from marginalized backgrounds have these motions still filed against them, so an important case. And then the last one I'll mention that was really uh, critical to her was uh, involved Martin Sostre, who was an incarcerated person who was confined in solitary um, after he was convicted on what was found to be trumped up drug charges uh, in the state of New York. He filed pro se uh, a case arguing that his constitutional rights were being violated under the Eighth Amendment because of the conditions of confinement. And we're talking about dark uh, places, small places, um, a cell where he could hear beatings. Uh, there were uh, attempted suicides and suicides. And he argued that it was inhumane. It was not uh, within constitutional bounds. He also argued that his First Amendment rights were being violated because the uh, prison officials would open his mail, um, read his communications with his lawyers. And Motley ruled in his favor. And it was deeply controversial for her to have done so, and very courageous, and she understood that. Uh, no one, other than the folks who were in the uh, nascent prisoners' rights uh, movement would have been upset if she'd ruled in favor of the government, but she did not. And she said it was because the right, it was the right thing to do. And on appeal, the Second Circuit upheld her First Amendment uh, ruling, but uh, really slapped her down in terms of the Eighth Amendment uh, ruling, because she had awarded him damages. And it was just, uh, it, was, it was considered an outrage uh, by members of law enforcement. So when she was presiding, that aspect of saying, well, she's a, she was a civil rights attorney, you know, had something to do with how people also perceived her rulings, right? Mm -hmm. uh, well, that, that is true, although in my work, I actually go to the record, I read thousands of cases that she decided, and although there was a perception that she, because of her practice background, her race and her gender would be um, often sympathetic to plaintiffs, it's really not the case. It, it was a, a stereotype. Her identity uh, bound her in a way that was uh, quite unfavorable, I would say, limited her ability to be appointed to the Court of Appeals, and she was even mentioned for the Supreme Court, uh, but uh, was not able to reach 
um, uh, that level, obviously, either, which is why this is such a sweet day, uh, a, a sweet moment um, to, to celebrate here. Yes. In fact, I, I have the quote from our guest of honor who said, uh, in terms of people who inspired her, I stand on the shoulders of so many who have come before me and actually in the Senate confirmation hearing and specifically highlighted mm. a Judge Motley. That's right. And I have to say, when I heard that, I danced a little jig. I was so, <laughs> I was so happy, just the confluence of the publication of this book and the nomination of... Uh, oh, let's just judge. say... <laughs> <laughs> a certain online ordering uh, company, yes. people were right then doing it. <laughs> but that's wonderful. Yes. That's yes. wonderful because she's being, no, no, you, no, even though you said that she didn't want to just be labeled, that, that the title of your book is Civil Rights Queen. Mm, it is. And I chose that title because it was a moniker given to her by a journalist who saw her um, down in Mississippi. Uh, and it, it really encapsulates how stunning she was in the sense of, you know, few people had seen a black lawyer, much less a woman lawyer, and this was a combination of a black woman lawyer. And she was just, uh, people were fascinated by her. And of course, some were hostile. Uh, towards her because she was breaking uh, societal boundaries in a way that was very threatening, certainly in the South. And you mentioned her friendship with Dr. King. Yes, yeah, she was great friends with uh, Dr. King. He respected her um, uh, and was so delighted to have her be a part of the Birmingham campaign. This was the uh, apocal campaign of the civil rights movement where Bull Connor released his dogs and fire hoses on civil rights protesters. Uh, and Motley represented not only King, but also children who were um, arrested, some of them, but expelled or suspended from school after they protested. And this got King in hot water. The parents were not happy uh, that he had put their, their children in harm's way. And Motley defended them when she arrived in Birmingham in the federal courthouse to argue the case. The judge said, well, you're a woman. And following the admonition of Thurgood Marshall, she, she said, well, yes, I am. And may it please the court. <laughs> you know, I'm the lawyer who has the expertise and who had been assigned to the case, and she was able to argue successfully on behalf of those students. So and it was it was a case that was really important to her, and I think in part because she had a son around the same age as some of those uh, demonstrators whom she left behind when she went to the South, which she did frequently to argue uh, for the civil rights movement. And so she was a trailblazer in the race and class, too. Yes. You talk about that in the book, too. That's right. Well, she grew up in the shadow of Yale. Uh, she was uh, from a working class immigrant family. Uh, all of her male relatives, including her father, worked uh, for the university. Her father worked as a chef for Skull and Bones. And when she, yes, it is true, uh, just a, a amazing uh, ascent. Um, and, and when she said even to her parents that she wanted to go to college, uh, she wanted to go to law school, they thought she was crazy. Her mother told her that she should pursue a more practical profession, that she should be a hairdresser, um, which we all need good hairdressers, but <laughs> she, had, she had more. Um, that she could do. And she ended up going to college and to law school thanks to the help of a philanthropist, uh, Clarence Blakesley, mm -hmm. who was a graduate of Yale and who heard her speak um, when she was still a teenager and offered to pay her way to college and law school. She said it was like a fairy tale. Um, and uh, Mr. Blakesley not only wrote checks, he actually took on a parental role. He wrote her letters when she was in college and law school, encouraging her to press on. 
and attended her law school graduation. Oh. So it's a great story. Hmm. <laughs> and then she found love. <laughs> she did, she did. And an important part of her ability as a woman lawyer in the 1940s and 50s to do what she did was the partner whom she chose, mm -hmm. uh, Joel Motley, who and was not threatened by her. He had his own profession. He co-parented. It was a love story uh, and, a, and a great one. And at a time when it's, it's hard to find those kinds of stories uh, at, at that time. And she had a full personal life. And she, she did. Kept in touch with her family and, and her she relatives. was a mother she kept in touch with her family she uh, was so busy uh, as a judge always working and she was a workaholic uh, but she would go back to New Haven and visit her family visit her community um, her family was from Nevis in the West Indies she would go there and of course they were all very proud of her um, but also she was being fed, her spirit was fed by interacting with people who knew her before she became uh, a judge. And that's the Alexander Hamilton. Yes, that is true. Too. That is true. Of all kinds of things. So when you think about in the book, uh, there's a lot of uh, inspiration and you did so much research on her life. Mm. Were some things coming out that you would advise others to think about. Sure. Well, uh, of course, um, Constance Baker Motley was highly intelligent, and yet I, I will say that to achieve the kinds of things that she did, especially embodied as she was, it took a whole lot more than being really smart. Um, she, and so I would encourage people who are aspiring to big things to really inculcate some of the personal qualities and values and personality traits that I found so compelling about Motley. Um, one of those things is she was incredibly hardworking. She just worked all the time. She was always prepared. This was when she was a lawyer, but also when she was a judge. Um, always prepared, did not like attorneys to come into her courtroom who were not prepared. And she would tell them uh, if they were not. Um, she was incredibly resilient. She said of herself that she was a woman who would not be put down. And she meant by that that she would not be made to feel inferior. She did not receive a lot of external validation, um, except from Marshall and the civil rights lawyers, but she was internally motivated. She knew what she could do. And that's so incredibly important um, a, a quality to have. Uh, she was a person who led with great humility. I tell a story about her being on the vineyard um, at oh, the yeah. golf club and President Bill Clinton and Vernon Jordan walking in and she's at a table with other federal judges and people of great stature and she says to them, stand up, stand up. The president's coming in, and when he approaches the table, she extends her hand and she goes to introduce herself as if she's just anybody. And, and President Clinton, in his way, his charming way, says, you don't have to introduce yourself to me. I know exactly who you are. Uh, it's just a great story that sort of reveals who she was as a person. And you also talk about how she mentored younger Absolutely. She mentored sure. generations of, of lawyers, her law clerks, uh, who found success in, in many areas. In fact, I would say that she uh, applied the, the norms and the law of the Civil Rights Act in her own chambers at a time when not a lot of judges were hiring women clerks or uh, people of color. And this is true, although these these clerks had great credentials, graduating from Harvard and other Ivy League schools. Uh, she chose them and then she encouraged them. Uh, she was very welcoming to other women judges and people of color judges once they started being appointed to the bench and that didn't really start happening in uh, critical numbers until the administration of President Carter. Um, she welcomed, for instance, Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor to the Southern District. Uh, when she joined that court, Motley was taking senior status at the time. And I think it's just terrific that she uh, did that because Carla 
No one did that for her. When she first went onto the bench in 1966, uh, some of her colleagues were just not happy to see her. She wasn't wanted there. In fact, one story that I recount in my book that I, I just find heartbreaking is the reality that when she first um, was appointed to the court, she felt unwelcome in the cafeteria where the judges ate. And, uh, but it ended up being um, a, a, an experience that caused her to bond with her clerks because they would go and get her lunch and she would eat with her clerks in chambers. Um, she loved Jewish food and Chinese food. <laughs> and the occasional <laughs> McMuffin. Uh, and, and so, uh, but, but she, she was welcoming to others when she had not had that for herself. You, um, before we end, and we could go on because yes. this is a wonderful book and there's so much uh, to learn and to enjoy uh, in this book. I wanted to, you dedicate it to your mother. I did. And you've also, in the acknowledgments, at the end of wonderful acknowledgments to so many people, you thank your mom for helping you select the photo that's on the cover. Yes. Which is in the Library of Congress's collection. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say that too, there's credit. Uh, and so how are you, because you were going through the collections. Yes. And doing it, so how did that happen? Right, uh, my mom did help me uh, select this photograph. It's unique, um, uh, very different from the others. Some of the, the, the main contender was one um, that showed her on the streets of New Orleans with the client. She was always well-dressed, and in that mm -hmm. photograph, she was well-dressed, she had a great handbag, uh, I, I liked it. Um, but sh my mom really liked this photograph, as did I, because you know she has her black sheath dress and her pearls, but she's flashing the victory sign. So it shows a kind of fierceness, and she was fierce. And also, she was joyful here. This was after she had been elected Manhattan Borough President. And I, I thought, and we thought, um, that it was important to show that joy um, and that sense of achievement, uh, because she really did face quite a lot in her life. And, and we wanted this uh, photograph to, to show her the spirit behind all of the achievements. And, my mom, uh, who was a person, I, I lost her due to cancer um, about a year ago. She was a person of, of very strong opinions. <laughs> uh, and, and she thought that this would make a good cover photo, and I think she was well, right. She was right. <laughs> she was right. And you should know that the Library of Congress uh, had a reproduction made and framed and, uh, for our guest of honor. Aww. So thank you. And thank you. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's available. <laughs> and we'll now enjoy a performance by the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Quartet.
I would now like to invite Justice Jackson to the stage to say a few words. So, so very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you all for being here. It is truly wonderful to have so many family members, friends, and distinguished guests all here together sharing in this celebration of my investiture. And I do hope that you are enjoying the extraordinary talent that the Library of Congress has gracious, graciously assembled. Thank you. I, I would like to give my personal thanks to the wonderful performing artists, to my judicial colleagues, past and present, and the incredible staff of both the Supreme Court and the Library of Congress, whose hard work has made this occasion possible. Uh, I also want to give a special thank you to the Library of Congress as an institution for hosting this event and to Dr. Hayden for authorizing it and for having such an insightful conversation with Dean Tamiko Brown-Nagin, whom I cannot thank enough for traveling here to give us her words of wisdom about my personal heroine, Judge Constance Baker Motley. Um, <laughs> It actually, as, as Dean Brown Nagin mentioned, it turns out to have been a complete coincidence that Dean Brown Nagin published her book about Judge Motley during the same period of time as I was being elevated uh, first to the DC Circuit and now to the Supreme Court. And as you may know, I have mentioned Judge Motley in uh, several speeches before, not just because we share a birthday, um, but also because I've long admired what I know about her career as a civil rights lawyer and later as the first black woman appointed to the federal bench. I knew about her fierce intellect, her tenacity, her resilience, and her grace. So it actually surprised me when after I first mentioned her during my nomination speech, a number of people told me that they didn't know anything about her. It was so unfortunate to me that such a pivotal figure who had so much influence is generally not well known, so I'm absolutely thrilled about Dean Brown Nagin's book because it's out there now as a resource for people who want to learn more about this extraordinary woman. Here this afternoon, I just wanted to take a few minutes to reflect on our shared experience, Judge Motley's and mine, as it relates to her relative invisibility. In the introduction to Civil Rights Queen, Dean Brown Nagin writes that as an author and historian, she was astounded by how little attention other writers had given to Constance Baker Motley. Moreover, she says, quote, the relative dearth of coverage struck me as not merely regrettable, but as a kind of historical malpractice. It deprived us of a more accurate and complete history. The invisibility of this fascinating woman in our public histories and our popular culture distorts our sense of who rebuilt America. Motley's invisibility in our nation's history shortchanges us all." End quote. When I read that, I was really struck by the idea that we all lose something when we don't have a good sense of history, when we're not aware of who and what has come before. But Dean Brown Nagin does not stop there. She takes the step, the concept of harmful invisibility, a step further by homing in on the impact of that loss for the most downtrodden and disaffected members of our society. Quote, Motley's invisibility in our nation's history shortchanges us, shortchanges us all 
but her absence is especially detrimental to the sense of belonging of the many communities she visibly represented. African Americans, West Indians, women, girls, immigrants, and the working class. Like all people, members of these groups, historically excluded from power in the United States and often still marginalized, benefit from seeing themselves portrayed as significant, successful stakeholders in the national project, end quote. Benefit from seeing themselves portrayed. As I reflect on my own recent experience of being appointed as the first black woman to serve on the Supreme Court, it is that more than anything that I have witnessed. People from all walks of life approach me with what I can only describe as a profound sense of pride and what feels to me like renewed ownership. I can see it in their eyes. I can hear it in their voices. They stare at me as if to say, look at what we've done. They say, they say this, this is what we can accomplish if we put our minds to it. They might not use those words, but I get the message. They are calling on the ancestors, hearkening back to history and claiming their stake at last. They're saying to me, in essence, you, girl, you go, girl. <laughs> They're saying, invisible no more. We see you and we are with you. I want you to know that I am deeply honored and humbled by the fanfare. And it is no small thing to be so widely encouraged and supported in this way. But I also know that it is not about me. The people who approach, and especially the young people, they are seeing themselves portrayed in me, in my experience. And they are finally believing that anything is possible in this great country. And of course, and of course that benefits us, benefits us all. As for me, I welcome these approaches and interactions because I so remember what it is like to be a young black girl and feeling utterly invisible. I remember desperately striving for distinction and looking anywhere and everywhere for affirmations of self-worth. I look to my wonderful parents who are here with me today and especially my father who studied law right before my very eyes. I look to my teachers, and especially the late Fran Berger, who taught me to reason and to write, and who clearly believed in my potential. And I looked to what I learned about Judge Constance Baker Motley. I never met her, but I knew of her career as a federal judge, and it was, in many ways, my North Star. Indeed, it was the support and affirmation of the people who were close to me on the one hand, and on the other, Judge Motley's modeling from afar that helped me to see and know the promise of America. And if I have one hope for the role that I now have and the work that I will do, it is that I can so inspire the children of today. At the end of the introduction to civil rights queen, Dean Brown Nagin sums up Judge Motley's life experiences in this way. Quote, 
Motley leaned in. She grabbed opportunities and endured challenges without making much fuss. Along the way, racism and sexism beset her just as they linger and disadvantage women and people of color today. Motley benefited from good fortune and experienced bad luck. She cultivated male and female sponsors and encountered male and female detractors. Sometimes she grew weary, even sad. Through it all, Constance Baker Motley kept moving." End quote. I too am on a path in which there have been and will be highs and lows. In reaching this incredible milestone, I have already benefited from great good fortune. And as I undertake the role of an associate justice, there is no doubt that I will have my share of pure bad luck. <laughs> I will have promoters and I will have detractors. But with your support and God's grace, Through it all, I will keep moving. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. I am truly grateful. I have a seat at the table now. <laughs> I have a seat at the table now and I'm ready to work.
Paul and Silas bound in jail had no money to go their bail. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. The only thing that we did wrong, we stayed in the wilderness a day too long. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on, hold on. Well, the only thing that we did wrong, it was the day we started to fight. Keep your
Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, Justice Jackson, Dean Brown Nagin, Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Quartet, Patrick Lundy and the Ministers of Music, Rutha May Harris, Joyce Lundy, and the Duke Ellington School of the Arts Concert Choir for helping us celebrate this momentous occasion. We hope you will join us for next year's Supreme Court Fellows Lecture uh, and will visit us in person and online at loc.gov and law.gov to explore the library's collections, which include papers of former Supreme Court justices and a digitized version of the US reports. That concludes our program. Uh, please remain seated for a moment to allow the justices to exit. Thank you.